after the relative stability of the Roman Republic, the years of the Roman Empire, when sometimes despotic lunatics had absolute control over the people and Senate of Rome were nightmarish. And perhaps one of the greatest examples of the turmoil of the period was the so-called Year of Four Emperors, when one man after another claimed the highest seat in Rome only to be overthrown themselves. It is history that deserves to be remembered. On June 9th, 68 AD, the Roman Emperor Nero stood at a villa outside of Rome trying to get up the courage to kill himself, as he had been declared a public enemy by the Senate. Unable to do the deed himself, he finally convinced his secretary to stab him, and he bled to death shortly thereafter. He was the last in the Julio-Claudian imperial line that had started with Julius Caesar's adopted son Augustus. The year of the four emperors had begun. Nero's rule had been falling apart for years. In 62 AD, he had several of his opponents assassinated, as was the custom at the time, and began to flout the Senate and patrician class, which consisted of the most wealthy and well-connected families in Rome. Alienating the most powerful people in Rome was unwise. When the Great Fire of Rome destroyed three of the 14 Roman districts in 64 AD, the Romans believed Nero had arranged for the fire to be set especially after he built an enormous palace on the cleared ground, including a 30-foot-tall statue of himself. Some of his political rivals spread the rumor that he had played the fiddle while Rome burned, referencing Nero's affinity for performing music and singing, which wasn't seen as an appropriate pastime for an emperor of Rome, and further damaged his reputation. In response to his critics, Nero instituted a tribute from the provinces to foot the massive bill to rebuild the city, and killed large numbers of Christians whom he blamed for the fire. Despite his efforts, Nero continued to be unpopular with the people. In 65 AD, a leading statesman named Gaius Piso planned to have Nero assassinated, a sign of the growing dissatisfaction among the ruling class. The plot was uncovered and Nero had the main conspirators executed, but the involvement of 19 senators in the plot demonstrated the extent of Nero's decline. Three years later, in 68 AD, Gaius Julius Vindex, a governor of Gaul, rebelled against Nero's tax policies. He decided that Servius Sulpicius Galba, governor of northern and central Spain, would make a better emperor than Nero. Vindex was quickly defeated near the ancient city of Vizanito, which is in eastern France today. Despite Vindex's fall, Galba decided to push his claim to the throne anyway. The final straw for Nero's reign was when the Praetorian Guard, the elite troops tasked with guarding the emperor, turned their allegiance to Galba, and Nero was forced to flee the city. Galba was briefly declared a public enemy by the Senate, but they switched sides and declared Nero a public enemy instead, accepting Galba as the new emperor. Galba was initially quite popular, but he began alienating support almost immediately. On his march to Rome, Galba destroyed or imposed fines on towns that would not accept him as emperor. One of his main goals was to rebuild the empire's treasury, and to that end Galba made probably the greatest blunder of his short reign. He refused to pay the Praetorian Guard the bribe that had been promised in his name. Building upon this mistake, he sentenced many to death without trial and was said to be deeply under the influence of three men, which made him appear to be weak. His favorites were known as the Three Pedagogues. On the 1st of January, 69, he faced a rebellion similar to what had just happened to Nero. Two legions in Germania refused to swear loyalty to the unpopular new emperor and declared their own governor, Vitilius, emperor instead. Sensing the danger to his new reign, Galba adopted as his heir Lucian Calpurnius Piso. Lucian was a nobleman of high birth known for his integrity, but the choice made few people happy, especially Marcus Salvius Otho, who had seen himself as the obvious choice as heir. A decade earlier, Otho had been sent away from Rome by Nero to be governor in western Spain. He had been Nero's friend, but after his wife became Nero's mistress, she divorced Otho and demanded he be banished. Otho had supported Galba's rebellion and was angling to be the childless, elderly Galba's successor. He made a deal with the consul, Titus Vinus, to marry Vinius's daughter if Vinius would support Otho as Galba's heir. Vinius did support Otho, but Galba thought Otho had loose morals and would be no better than Nero. Otho decided to assassinate both Galba and his new heir in order to take the empire for himself. He paid a number of the Praetorian Guard to support him and on the 15th of January was declared emperor by the guard at their camp outside of Rome. Galba, hearing rumors of the coup, left the palace and ran into Otho in the Forum. Most of the emperor's guard abandoned him, and Galba, Vinius, and others were killed on the spot. 
According to Plutarch, the aged emperor offered his neck and shouted, Strike, if it be good for the Romans. Famously, only one Praetorian, Sipronius Densus, stood by the emperor rather than either turning on him or running away, and made his last stand against his former brothers in arms. Lucian took refuge in the temple of the Vestal Virgins, hoping that Otho would respect the sanctity of the temple, but he was soon found, dragged out, and killed. Otho gave Galba's head to his camp followers, who paraded it around in a mocking ceremony. Galba had been emperor for only seven months. Otho was aware that he had taken advantage of the offended Praetorian guards, as well as the populace's enduring fondness for Nero in his ascension. He ordered Nero's statues replaced, and Nero's great palace finished. Otho soon learned, however, that overthrowing an emperor was easier than being one. The historian Suetonius quoted him as saying, Playing the long pipes is hardly my trade, which meant he feared he had undertaken something he did not have the ability to do. Otho also inherited the problem of Vitilius, who had not only declared himself emperor against Galba, but had already sent two legions to attack Italy. Otho tried to secure peace with his rival and offered to marry Vitilius's daughter, but it was too late. Otho marched north on the 14th of March to meet the Vitilian legions and put his brother, Titanus, in charge of the armies. Though more experienced generals advised waiting for reinforcements, Otho and Titanus were impatient and pressed the attack. Otho's legions were defeated on April 14th at the First Battle of Bedriacum, and the entire force surrendered. 40,000 soldiers are said to have died in the fighting. Though he still had an army and some of Otho's advisors encouraged him to fight on, Otho instead chose to commit suicide. In a speech to his men he said, It is far more just to perish one for all than many for one, and stabbed himself in the heart on the morning of April 16th, 69. He had ruled only 91 days, which would stand as the shortest reign of any Roman emperor until Pertinix's 86-day reign 130 years later. Otho would be remembered kindly by the people, as the Romans believed he had made an honorable choice in order to avoid an extended civil war. The Roman Senate, always aware of which way the political winds were blowing, recognized Vitilius as emperor. Prior to becoming emperor, Vitilius had some experience in government, having served as consul and proconsul of Africa earlier in his career. He rose to such popularity with the men who would elevate him to emperor by outrageous good nature. But in keeping with the same habits that made him popular, Vitilius's reign was fraught with excess. The historian Suetonius says that Vitilius threw three sumptuous banquets a day, inviting himself over to a different noble's house for each one. He spent money lavishly and sent the Roman navy to seek out new and exotic foods for his palate. How much of this was libel after his death by his political enemies and how much of it was true is not clear, but parts of the Roman Empire were not happy with Vitilius's reign. In July 69, two months after Vitilius had taken the throne, the Roman legions in Egypt and Judea declared Titus, Flavius, Vespasianus, better known as Vespasian, Emperor of Rome. Vespasian had made his name fighting first in Britain in 43 AD, where he served with distinction. He was then made governor of Africa, where instead of lining his pockets through corruption, he courted political allies. Despite his distinguished career, Vespasian lost the emperor's favor during Nero's reign when he lost interest, perhaps falling asleep, during one of the emperor's recitals. After this faux pas, Vespasian was sent to suppress the Jewish revolt in Judea in 66. Vespasian was still besieging Jerusalem in 69 when Vitilius became emperor. On July 1st, he was declared emperor by the legions in Egypt and Alexandria, and several other regions recognized him shortly thereafter. Though an army had been sent from Syria, legions from nearby Danubian provinces invaded Italy, defeating a Vitilian army at the Second Battle of Bedriacum in October 69. One of Vitilius's generals, who had won the First Battle of Bedacrium, tried to switch his allegiance to Vespasian, but was instead put in chains by his soldiers, who fought leaderless. The leaderless legions fought hard, but were ultimately defeated when one of Vespasian's Gallic legions faced the east to salute the sun as it rose, a custom they had picked up while serving in Syria. The Vitellian legions mistook this salute for men greeting reinforcements and fled. Vitellius decided to give up his throne because his position was too precarious to hold. The Praetorian Guard refused to let him abdicate, forcing Vitellius to take refuge in Rome instead. He made several attempts to either negotiate a peace and defend Rome, but ultimately Vespasian's legions entered the city in December. There was heavy fighting between the warring factions, and the temple to Jupiter was destroyed, which was a very big deal for the superstitious Romans. 
Vitilius was eventually dragged out of hiding by Vespasian supporters and killed. His last words were, Yet I was once your emperor. He had been emperor for about eight months. So ended the year of four emperors. Vespasian was recognized by the Senate on the 21st of December, 69, a year which had began with Galba on the throne. After crowning Vespasian, Rome enjoyed a period of relative peace until 79. He was the first emperor to hail from an equestrian family, which was considered to be a lower class than a patrician family. When Vespasian's son, Titus, became emperor, he broke ground again as the first emperor to be succeeded by his natural son. He is remembered positively by historians of the time, such as Tacitus, Josephus, and Suetonius, though this may have been in part because of his own patronage of the writers in supporting his reign. The Flavian dynasty he founded would last 27 years. During the year of the four emperors, the Praetorian Guard and the legions demonstrated their power again and again, first by raising a man to power and then by casting him aside and choosing someone else. That's the sort of empire building that came from Julius Caesar, who entered Rome with his legion, saying, Alia iacta est, or the die is cast, breaking the long-standing tradition of keeping Rome's conquering legions out of the city of Rome. And so perhaps Caesar shares responsibility for the chaos that followed. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section and I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe. 